Hello everybody and welcome back to KXP, where we aim to explore the farthest reaches of the cosmos. In today's episode, we are going to be taking that great step forward, and we are going to send a Kerbal to the Mun. This episode is a little bit longer than normal, and that's primarily because of the build portion of this. Uh, I decided to leave it in. It's a fairly complicated craft, so uh, I wanted to include it. However, if that's not really your style, if you don't really care about building, once we get to that section, I will put a timestamp on the screen and you can skip ahead to the actual launch of the mission. And then it turns out to be a 37 minute episode, which is still a little long, but not nearly as long as this one is already. So we take a look at our contracts. Uh, most of them are planes or testing parts. We have the Minmus probes, which is part of our strategy of program. However, the way that we have our program set up is not exactly ideal. So let's upgrade our administration building. That'll give us uh, the ability to have three programs active. And uh, we are going to change them around a little bit to better suit us because currently any other celestial body or mission is going to have a negative debuff added to it because if it's not min miss it's not in our program uh, and like I mentioned before we are going to be going to the Mun uh, the launch pad is one of the few buildings that we have left to upgrade and I do end up upgrading it uh, off camera at one point and the research and development would be great to update or upgrade, um, especially before our mission. However, uh, I do not do it, and in hindsight, uh, yeah, I kind of regret it. I uh, had a lot of money at one point. The astronaut complex we needed to upgrade because until we got that to the next level, our astronauts would not have been able to leave their craft outside of the surface of Kerbin and we're going to need them to plant a flag because we just accepted a couple missions um, dealing with that. One was to explore Minmus, one was to explore the Mun. Uh, and the rest of the contracts aren't really relevant to what we want to do, so we're not going to take them. We have uh, plenty to deal with right now. The testing contracts we may end up just canceling. Um, we primarily grab them to gain access to the parts that they were asking us to test because those parts were we were able to access early but now that we have more science and we're unlocking more things we may uh we may end up canceling those so here we are we're spending the majority of our science unlocking a crew capsule because we want to send kerbals now we've been doing a lot of uh a lot of probe missions but time to send kerbals and this is where the thought to do the mun started to happen because our program in strategy is the minimus probes oh well probes uh right now uh if building's not your thing if you want to skip to the launch go ahead and go to this timestamp here and uh you won't miss much i'll see you then okay so now into the build this first part isn't going to matter too much because we end up not using the majority of this first probe. Uh, however, it's still part of the build process and I like to, to share kind of what's going on with my mindset. Currently, I am still under the assumption that we are going to be landing a probe on Minmus. And uh, because we don't have any satellites out there, we have no control over any probes. We are going to pair this little lander probe with a crew capsule and hopefully the crew capsule will be able to bounce enough signal off it to uh, land the probe. Uh, I will be incorrect in this thought but you know that is uh, that is the goal. So I am designing a craft that will gather science in both uh, low space and on the surface wherever it decides to land. So currently we are just putting all of our science experiments on different action groups so we can just press a single button to run all experiments. Unfortunately, due to the uncurbled start mod, our uh, probe cores no longer offer telemetry reports, so that's one less science experiment to be had. So we tucked uh, four extra batteries in there, and then it's all kept neatly in, in the little storage compartment. 
Very nice. I like to do a lot of my probes like this just to have the, the science buried. Keeps everything nice and aerodynamic instead of having it all tacked on the side. So I have three communication dishes that will eventually turn into four. I have three solar panels, which again, eventually will turn into four, but much later. I was going with a three-way symmetry right now because I wasn't expecting to have to cover the MUN as well. Here I have one for active vessel, one for Kerbin, and one for Minmus. And we just put a small tank of fuel with the tiny little, uh, I believe it's called the Pug engine? I'm not sure, but it's the only vacuum uh, efficient engine that we have currently because we have not unlocked very much in the in the ways of engines. This uh, episode currently uh, is filmed before the last episode where we sent a, a rover to the North and South Pole. Uh, we sent the rover because after we created the rocket that we're going to be making, we got a little frustrated with the engines that we had and the poor thrust to weight ratio that we, we had to work with. And so, uh, yeah, so then we launched the, the mission to the poles to gather the science needed to upgrade our engine. So currently we are pre that point. Unfortunately, those engines didn't include any vacuum rated engines. So anywhere you see the pug engine will continue to be that. But the, uh, what's it called? The Sphinx, I think it was called the engine that we uh, used the contract to unlock will no longer be used because that engine was terrible. The thrust to weight ratio for any rocket was always below one uh, even when we, we overpowered it. So I just did my first test and realized that I hadn't said anything to an action group and so when we went out there we had absolutely no control. So we're going to go ahead and set all those and we're going to try again. Uh, see if this can successfully land on Minmus. So let's go ahead and deploy our antennas so that way we'll have communication right on the get right off the get-go. See, here we are turning those to four. We still keep the communica uh, Communitron 16s at three-way symmetry. Uh, we didn't e need more than one of those, but we just kept it for symmetry's sake. Uh, and uh, once again, we did not have control over the probe because we didn't have any signal. So we are going to start figuring out how we can bring a crew along with us. And I wanted to include the building of the probe because uh, the, the problems that I had with the probe led to the solutions that I created with the crude capsule. And even though we're going to be discarding portions of that probe, other portions will be used. So I want to gather as much science as possible on this mission. So we're going to make it a two-part crew with a scientist in the Mach 1 capsule and the pilot in the airplane uh, cockpit. So let's get some communication devices on there so we can... Uh, keep in contact with Kerbin as well as bounce uh, a relay signal off for the probe. At least that was the plan. And I am also going to want to get some science from space, uh, low space and high space. So we are going to get rid, or excuse me, we're going to copy and paste the uh, science bay and then get rid of the communication dishes on there and just use the ones that were already attached might as well uh, it covers everything that we need it to cover so so let's go ahead and run another test and that test proved pretty conclusively that this lander is a terrible idea so this is when I changed my mind and we're like all right you know what let's go to the mun uh, for our Minmus program, if we land crew there, we're going to not have quite nearly the gains that we want. Um, also, we haven't landed uh, a Kerbal on the Mun yet, so why would we start with, with Minmus? You know, we 
You gotta take it uh, baby steps at a time. So we're throwing on some solar panels here, but since we're planning on uh, retrieving this part of the capsule, uh, and we don't have access to solar panels that retract, we're just gonna put them on tiny little uh, decouplers. Radi yeah, radial decouplers. So that way when we go to enter Kerbin's atmosphere, we can get rid of them so they don't explode. Throw a couple parachutes on there, throw some uh, drug chutes to slow us down. We want to make sure we take every single precaution to keep our carpal safe. So then we go ahead and turn down the ablator because in my experience you don't really need that much. You don't really need that much? You don't really need that much? So now we got our communication dishes all set up. We should be able to keep ourselves in contact. Uh, and if for some reason, if we end up losing control and just uh, end up staying in space, then at least uh, our wreckage will be a relay station for those who will hopefully come and rescue them. So let's go ahead and get these all on action groups. I keep accidentally uh, moving the communication dishes. I want to have this kind of, it's not exactly a three-way symmetry, but it's three dishes uh, as best as I can place them. And so now it is time to put the rocket to this. Uh, and we are going to be using uh, these kind of spaced out uh, side decouplers. Uh, I wasn't able to get the original rail decouplers off. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that down again. Smart decision. Anyways, we're going to use these right here uh, once again in a three-way symmetry. They will block our pilot from being able to go onto EVA, unfortunately, but uh, it was the best kind of configuration that we had. Go for this nice gray and orange tank color. Kind of make this uh, Corvette looking craft. We're going to go ahead and put our solar panels on these, which is why we got rid of them on the center craft. I thought about putting the engine on the bottom like here, like so, but uh, that would make our lander way too tall, so I decided against that for this kind of wider look. It's not very realistic, but it is very Kerbal. So we have the, uh, these three engines here, which should get us landed on the Mun and back home, and that lower engine and stage will be what transfers us from low Kerbin orbit to the MUN and hopefully assist with our MUN capture, but who knows just yet. So I had a little issue when I tried to do the simulation, sometimes it likes to grab the craft, it's very annoying. So we go ahead and do our simulation and uh, it's actually pretty good. This is a pretty good craft, it can handle landing, it can handle uh, recovering or returning and re-entry. So all we now need to do is create a vehicle capable of putting it in orbit. And if we can just get this thing in orbit, then we know all of our troubles will be solved. So this is the point that I was mentioning earlier where I was struggling with the engines. As you can see here on the to the right, the KER, Kerbal Engineer Redux, at the very bottom stage, uh, we have a 0.45 thrust to weight ratio. In the atmosphere, it's even worse. And uh, that's because those engines and these engines are just too terrible. They are not going to be able to handle a rocket of this size and caliber. It's, it would force us to do probes because probes are smaller, obviously uh, less materials necessary to lift it into space. So if we want to do a crude landing, we're going to need a massive rocket in order to handle this. And even with three extra side boosters with three Sphinx engines, that was just not nearly enough to handle it. So we're going to kind of adjust ourselves a little bit. We're going to get rid of Probe Frenzy because that is going to cost, uh, cost us 100% uh, extra on a crude launch vessel. So we can't, we can't have that. That would cost us way too much. We're going to go ahead and take this to boldly go uh, level two and that uh, gives us funds and um, science uh, from from new biomes that, that allows us to progress from there. We're going to kind of look through things. We don't have uh, 
the option to pick very many things right now. We don't have enough reputation for certain things, uh, such as the actual MUN program and the Minimus program, and I think we actually locked ourselves out of the MUN program because we've orbited already. Strategia is a little strange. Uh, there's not a lot of information to go off of. You kind of have to do a lot of reading and, and figuring out yourself, so uh, I'm only partially uh, familiar with it, so I'm doing, <laughs> doing the best I can. Uh, we want to cancel this Minimus probes because, once again, it's going to cost us, but uh, if we cancel it without completing it, we will take a huge hit in money, which we just can't afford. So there we are, we accepted the, to boldly go. The other one that we're going to accept, uh, we did that off camera though, is Massive Scale Launches 2. And what that does is it gives us funds and reputation whenever we reach orbit with a craft weighing over a certain amount. Uh, the craft in question that we have is quite big. So hopefully we'll be able to achieve some extra funds that way. So now let's head back to uh, the VAB. And now we are in the future after we had completed the, the mission that you saw in the last episode. So now this is us uh, having unlocked uh, better engines. Unfortunately, we don't have better vacuum engines, but... That will come once we can get better science. But here we are with the Kodiak liquid fuel engine. We have access to the swivel and the the Reliant, but I've never actually played around with this Kodiak before. I'm not sure I'm even familiar with it. So uh, it has a great thrust to weight ratio, and when you stack them in three, uh, this thing has over 2.0 thrust to weight ratio, which means that this will very easily lift off from the pad and get us into low carbon orbit. Our second stage uh, after the side boosters are pushed out will be enough to get us into orbit mostly. So we will burn a little bit of our pug engine, the, the gray and orange ones, but uh, that's good because then it'll just mean that there's less space trash for us. Let's go ahead and put some, fin, uh, some tail fins on there to stabilize it as well as give us control because I don't believe the Kodiak has any gimbal. So we're gonna need those, uh, those fins as well as that reaction wheel, that very small reaction wheel that I tucked in there. Let's go ahead and put a camera on here because I may want to do some IVA mode. And uh, we're gonna go ahead as well and put a flag on here using the minimalist Kerbal flag. The link to the mod will be in the description below, but. We started off by putting a Minimus flag. I want to design this with Minimus in mind as well because a Mun lander can typically handle a Minimus landing as well. So let's go ahead and uh, once we saved that as Minimus, we changed the flag to be the Mun flag and now we changed it to be the Mun lander. So we're going to put some uh, landing gears or landing legs on that. I don't think we're going to use that stage utilize it enough to land, but I figure just on the off chance that we have enough fuel to land with it, let's put some legs on there. So we are going to make a few changes. We need to uh, add everything to the action groups that are appropriate. Uh, we want our parachutes to uh, deploy at the right time, which would be very useful if I actually clicked on the right parachute and set it to deploy on time. But we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes later. But uh, yeah, we got our communications, uh, put a reaction wheel on the top of that because we wanna make sure I play around with putting another camera on there and then eventually give up on that. I don't need more than one camera. So we're gonna go ahead and do another test flight just to make sure everything is looking good. And this was a whole thing, like I made, uh, I did, I did the entire mission in that test flight to see that the rocket can function, and for the most part it does. Uh, somewhere along there I got rid of one of the side boosters and uh, opted for two side boosters instead. One part that I saw that could use some improvement is what we're doing right now, and we are going to put this little capsule that uh, its, its purpose is to collect all the science aboard a craft and collect it into this little capsule uh, so we're going to set that to an action group and then that way every time we run our science experiments action group afterwards we're going to press 
the four key and then that will collect all the experiments on board and put it into there so Bob all he has to do is climb down and reset the science junior and the mystery goose so we go ahead and pop that in and we are ready to launch this is uh, pretty much good there's something weird with our launch clamps but they work so anyways welcome back everybody if you skipped ahead welcome back you didn't miss much we changed our strategy programs around a little bit so now once we get a very heavy craft into orbit we'll get a little bit of money from that so let's go ahead and launch our new engines um, have a heavy thrust away but yeah that was the other thing we unlocked new engines kind of off camera between the last episode and this episode there was some time jumping and product of the last episode with the unlocking of these Kodiak engines and right now we have a thrust to weight ratio of a little bit over 2.0 so this thing is hauling towards the towards the Carmen line 20 seconds left in our side boosters but of course we are using asparagus staging to refill our center tank And, uh, yeah, other than that, it's just a very peaceful, calm, typical launch, uh, you know, trying to get as best of a gravity turn as possible. I am doing it by hand. Let's go ahead and stage those off. They do have parachutes on there, and we do have stage recovery mod, so hopefully we'll gain some funds back from that. I do forget pretty often to check the stage recovery mod, uh, spreadsheet to see that we actually did indeed recover funds from it so i went ahead and skipped forward to more of the circularization burn and i started to get this wobbly effect and so i decided to kill the engine early and sadly we're going to have to use more of our corvette fuel uh, to circularize than i would have liked but that was starting to lose control very quickly and i was afraid that if i didn't stage we could have lost the whole mission so here we are, circularizing, and uh, looking pretty fun. We get uh, some funds, 40000 for launching a craft. Uh, I believe it was 40 tons gets you 40000 70 tons gets you 75000 plus some reputation, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure. Anyways, we're going to do some science here in low carbon orbit because we have access to new science that we hadn't done before. We're going to get Bob out. He's going to take an EVA report as well as collect and uh, restore. He, oh, he doesn't actually have to collect because that uh, box on top already did. So all he needs to do is restore the science and uh, get back on board. He's going to do that a couple times in this mission. Uh, that is the primary goal of this mission. What, uh, it is exploration, of course. We are taking our first steps on the MUN first steps on any celestial body for that matter so Jebediah is excited Bob is equally excited but uh, it doesn't feel like being on camera so now that we are in orbit since the Mun has a uh, very little inclination change to Kerbin we don't need to do anything as far as inclination so we can just go ahead and plot out our maneuver Pretty easy, if you put the MUN at the 12 o'clock position, you want your maneuver to be roughly 3. And then you just burn prograde until you make a rendezvous. So we want to get a nice equatorial um, interception, but it's really hard to do on the first try. So uh, we are going to just get what we can and then plot in a mid-course correction. We get ourselves lined up to the right node and pass over a storm front. Nice uh, couple little thunderstorms down there. And we're just going to time warp. As you can see from our maneuver plotter on our nav ball, we will be using up all the fuel in that uh, extra tank that hangs off the center of the back. but. Once again, we asparagus staged it uh, into the side tank, so once that is out of fuel, we will still, once again, have a full tank of gas. Well, hydrogen and oxygen. 
we are starting our burn and uh, these pug engines uh, are vacuum efficient but they are still very low thrust to weight ratio so it does take quite a bit to burn them uh, went ahead and skipped forward a little bit further uh, it would have skipped just the end of the burn but then I for some reason decided to run my science experiments once again which was good because, you know, look at all that science that we're grabbing. Excellent. Name of the game. And then I collect all the experiments into the box. And I think, hey, why don't I get Bob out uh, to <laughs> collect the data, restore the uh, experiments, and then hop back into the thing. Never once paying attention to the fact that I was mid-burn that entire time. And I, that very well could have gone very badly. Bob could have fallen off the ladder and then just been lost, just flown far behind, left to uh, circular, uh, left in orbit. Uh, you know, we could have flipped our craft and then no longer be pointed at the right uh, point, and all sorts of bad comes from exiting a moving vehicle. But uh, Jeb was uh, Jeb was impressed. Bob uh, <laughs> Bob managed to impress Jeb, so. It, it's been a good trip so far. So let's go ahead and just manually bring in our periapsis a little bit. Once again, though, it's hard to get an equatorial uh, approach that way. So we're just going to go midway through our uh, course. And we're going to burn normal a little bit until we reach our desired angle. And then we're going to burn retrograde until we reach our desired altitude. We want to come in nice and low, so that way we reach low space. And when we orbit, we are orbiting in low space. And above the mud, I believe that is below 30? I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I'm not going to look it up. If you know, uh, please let me know in the comments. Uh, but I think it's below 30 on the mud. I think the MUN is the, the close one. Min miss, I think you have a lot more room with low space. But here we are, we're at 30 kilometers, which I guess technically I should be slightly under, but I think it works. You know what, maybe I'm wrong about that 30 kilometers because I do we do get low space here. But anyways, we plot in our capture burn. We do some uh, science in high space. A lot of it we've already done before, but a few of the experiments we haven't, so it all works. And we had definitely not done any EVA reports because we have never gotten a Kerbal this far. All those orange uh, texts on the upper left is just me uh, collecting the data from uh, into that storage box. So yeah, pretty, pretty standard stuff, you know, just get to a little bit higher of a biome and just do some more science, get Bob out to reset, come back in and then wait for the next maneuver. So I'm skipping ahead a little bit to the actual sphere of influence changeover. So now we are in high space above the mud. So let's go ahead and do science experiments once more. <laughs> yep. And as always, we're going to get Bob out and collect everything. This was a lot harder to do in uh, first person in uh, KSP POV, especially with the amount of lag that I had in my game. There was a lot of stuff that I had to fight against low FPS for, but uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how it will be flying around in uh, first person mode now that I, I can I can actually handle uh, some performance with it and I'm not playing at 15 frames a second so uh, I think I'm not certain I'm not making any promises just yet because I do have quite a lot on my plate already but I think we definitely should revisit KSP POV uh, now that we can run it in real time but that'll come that'll come sometime later for now kxp is uh what we're going to be focusing on we're going to be focusing on the exploration of it uh the parallax mod makes uh, all the planets look very beautiful 
We're running at high graphics, so that also helps. And uh, we have a fun little flag pack uh, that we want to utilize and discover all the places in the Kerbal system. So for now, let's just focus on that. So here we are, approaching the mud. It is a low 30 kilometer apoapsis, or periapsis. And uh, we use uh, remote text flight computer to handle the capture burn. I didn't mention in this episode, I think I mentioned before, but all of our automated processes are gonna be handled through flight computer, not mech job. Um, and that is because we are using remote tech and flight computer has an option to program in signal delay. And that is going, it doesn't really matter here uh, on the MUN or on Midmus. We're very close to Kerbin, so the signal delay is a matter of milliseconds, nanoseconds maybe. But uh, once we start going to things like Duna, there's going to be a bit of a challenge when it comes to probes because there's going to be a delay between the time you press a key and when it actually happens. So uh, landing will become quite a challenge. So here we are grabbing the science and restoring the experiments for low space above the mud. Hop back into the sea. We're also using free IVA. That's why it keeps saying I have to hop back into the seat. In the Mach 1 uh, crew cabin and in that uh, aircraft capsule, I can't remember the name of it right now, but uh, there's not really much room to move around. But once we start unlocking bigger capsules or uh, station parts, we're going to be kind of uh, experimenting with uh, the free IVA mod and roaming around the capsule during uh, the spaces in between flights. So I think that's going to be fun. Anyways, we put the trajectory mod on and just basically pointed retrograde and found a spot to land. Didn't really plot it through, didn't make any maneuvers. So uh, we're just going to see where we land, see what kind of science we can get, see what kind of exploration there is to be had. This is just going to be kind of a touch and go landing. Um, we're not going to be exploring very much. We're not going, you know, to be going to different biomes. There's no guarantee that we're going to have enough fuel to get home. So we're going to have to play things very close to the chest uh, and hopefully get these two back alive. So we're just time warping towards the surface. We're gonna rotate our craft so that way, not only is the window facing down so the crew can get a good view of it, but that way our craft is aligned the right way for the most uh, stable entry. If I were to have just a single bit on the bottom, there's a chance that the craft could tip over. So aligning yourself correctly is very important when it comes to, to moon landings. Here we are in the Starlex Mach 1 capsule, and then here is the Warbirds uh, capsule, which, uh, because of our landing gear, it is having a very hard time with that. Did not like the fact that we don't have actual uh, wheels. So here we are, where our surface speed is coming down fairly quickly, but uh, still not quick. Quickly enough, our suicide burn countdown is right at its limit, so if we were to turn off the engine, we could very easily miss our mark and crash. This is, uh, this is gonna be a nail biter. There's nothing I can do. Uh, the data won't really tell me anything. I will either land safely or not. So we go ahead and go into cinematic mode because if these crumbles are going to die, they're going to go out with a bang. But thankfully, I was only 0.2 seconds off from my suicide burn countdown. So it takes absolutely no effort to come down safely. <laughs> there we are. We are now on the mun. Parallax rocks all around us. Uh, every single one of these rocks has a collision, uh, which means that if 
one of our landing legs were to have landed on the rock rather than phasing right through it, it would have tilted us over. So the fact that we landed where we did is just astounding because this is, I couldn't have asked for a better landing spot. So let's go ahead and do all of our surface science, everything that we can, collect it all. And Jebediah can't go on EVA because unfortunately his uh, door is blocked by this um, side engine. So Bob, even though Jeb was the Kerbal that got them to the Mun, Bob gets the honor of planting the flag. And it's one small flop for Kerbal. One giant skip for Kerbal Kind. So I kind of wish that I had changed the suits so that way we could have had the glowy suits for this. Uh, for some reason, the sun is just not our friend right now and we can't see the flag or any of the real details on things. So that was unfortunate, but... Uh, there we did it. We landed on the mud. We planted a flag. Now it's just time to uh, get these kerbals home. So, you know, Bob just needs to get back in the capsule. So, yeah. Uh, you know, just just get back in the capsule, Bob. You, you have a you have an RCS pack. You got this. Just, just move forward. Move, move forward up or anywhere. Just any direction. Yeah, so I had... Uh, I had forgotten that I had rebound my uh, key bindings for the RCS. I should have been using the number pad. Uh, I had completely forgotten that until much, much, much later. So I'm just wondering why my RCS pack isn't working. So instead, I just go the old school way of utilizing the MUN's low, low gravity and just kind of jumping my way up there. I'm sure Jeb had quite a laugh as he saw Bob struggling to get up the ladder. So we ignored the warnings. I'm sure Jeb loved the fact that that warning had been going off this entire time. But uh, we ignore the warnings and we go ahead and prep ourselves for takeoff. Looking at our missions, we uh, all of our missions require that were relevant to the moon require us to arrive back home safely. So they're not going to be checked off until then. So there's nothing new to be gained from that. So let's go ahead, lift off from the surface. We're gonna point ourselves east and we're gonna burn until we reach orbit and then we're gonna keep burning until we get back to Kerbin's sphere of influence. Do some more science because we're over a different biome now, low space. I really like the look of this thing. Like I, like I mentioned before, it's kind of like a, a little space Corvette. There's just something very sleek and speedy about it. If it had better engines, like if it just had like Terriers or something, that would be, uh, that'd be great, but it'd be all fast and agile. Uh, also, if it had a better reaction wheel, I think. RCS on it. So there's some there's some room for improvement to to really make this this thing good. But this is uh, as low tech as we can get in the uncurbled start to make a mun landing. Uh, well, no, we could have gotten even lower tech because the uh, Russian style um, uh, Orion capsule uh, we can unlock with even less science. So that would be technically a lower tech. You know, we could probably do this a lot lower tech. Maybe we'll try that sometime. Just do this, you know, how low can you go to get to the MUN in an uncurbled start? Be interesting. So now that the alarm is no longer going off, it's nice and peaceful in all the capsules. We had the probe control room there because we have the probe core on the top, but we're not going to be using it and the camera changes to let us know that we are now in orbit of the Mun, no longer on a impact trajectory, which is always nice to see. So let's go ahead and keep burning prograde until our apoapsis breaks free of the Mun's sphere of influence and comes back around. It's a very large orbit. It's not great. That means we're going to have to burn off a lot of speed, but it's doable. 
our communications network, as you see there, those uh, bright green lines, or green lines anyways, uh, let us know that we are receiving signal from one of our relays. We plot in our return maneuver at the apoapsis, and uh, funnily enough, we actually get another MUN encounter, and that will actually bring our apoapsis and periapsis down very much considerably with, uh, with very little delta V required. 87 meters of delta V to bring down our uh, orbit that much? Yes, please. So we're going to go ahead and plot in our maneuver, and then we're going to kind of warp around until we get that uh, second encounter. Just watching the blue orb revolve, the gray orb revolve around that. And then it's time for our burn. It's a relatively short one because a little goes a long way this far out. And like I said before, it's only 87 meters, so... Excuse me, 87 meters per second. So now that we have uh, our trajectory placed, all that's left to do is time warp until we reach the sphere of influence. So we get a nice little shot set up to see our planet as we just whip on by. And now we're coming to the mud, and we're coming at it pretty fast. Our ankle seems a little suspect. And uh, if I didn't know better, I'd say we were about to hit. Yep, yeah, we're definitely about to hit. <laughs> so we go ahead and go into map view. I was planning on just letting it go cinematic as we pass by the MUN. I thought that would be pretty cool to see. Just, you know, swing by curb and swing by the MUN. But uh, I'm glad we took a second to stop because that would have been impressive to see. Uh, you know, two of our best Kerbals die in a horrible, horrible impact, but uh, if we can prevent that, <laughs> then we're going to. I'm not, I don't know if I'm doing permadeath in here. I think I set the settings to where dead Kerbals don't respawn. I think I always set that setting, but uh, we're going to try very hard not to kill any Kerbals unnecessarily. And of course, the longer uh, time a mission goes on the less likely I will feel comfortable resetting anything or reverting saves or anything like that so we will uh, we'll always try our best to keep Kerbal safety in mind first so now we can go ahead and have a nice cinematic view as we whip on by Oof, we almost saw you for a second landing. And we could have possibly prevented death. We probably could have possibly pointed retrograde and burned enough to uh, to land a second time. We might have enough fuel for that, but uh, then we would have been stuck. Like, we definitely would have had to get a rescue group. We have a nice little lineup of Eve and Duna. And I think another planet, but it wasn't it wasn't highlighting. Distant object enhancements is a lot of fun to just be like, oh, what's that little blue orb over there? And it's like, oh, that's uh, that's Lathe. And it's like, oh, if that's Lathe, and that one is Eve. Very fun. Anyways, we have our periapsis now lowered. Uh, our orbit now lowered quite considerably so we can just plot in a maneuver to uh, lower our uh, periapsis and then lower our orbit so here we are utilizing all of our fuel and then some we don't have enough to actually make it so we're going to have to kind of adjust things to uh, to make sure that we can arrive back home I wasn't paying attention to the fact that my periapsis was already at the 41 kilometer mark, which means that we are going to be coming in at a fire reentry. Uh, but 
41, anywhere between 42 and uh, 39 kilometers, I found to be quite effective at uh, reducing the amount of times you have to come back through the atmosphere. But of course, that requires you to have a good amount of ablator. So you don't really need that much? So we time warp to our periapsis. And of course, it will kill our time warp before we enter the atmosphere, but I do want to slow it down so we don't have to uh, glitch our way through. Because I have had it where it just glitches its way straight through the atmosphere all the way to the other side. And that's no good for anyone. We go ahead and get word from Mission Command that we are cleared for landing. Uh, they ask us to minimize the distance that they have to go pick us up from. You know, gas is expensive. And uh, they ask us if we could land as close to the KSC as possible. They'd appreciate that. So we are going to be using all of the fuel in our tanks in order to slow down but unfortunately as soon as we hit the atmosphere our data on that changed and it turns out it's going to take a lot more fuel to lower our orbit than we expected or even have so the best we can do is just burn off all 700 meters per second of it but then suddenly our heating effect gets pretty intense we didn't bring in any of the solar panels or communication dishes or anything. We didn't prep in any way for re-entry. So uh, things start blowing up, I get nervous, and I just jettison the engines. You know, I don't want them blowing up around me and then just destroying the entire craft. So we are going to have to take whatever periaps or whatever apoapsis change it gave us, which uh, wasn't very much. Uh, we're just going to have to take it and ride the atmosphere and see if we can get down uh, in as few orbits as possible. Our periapsis is uh, below 42 uh, kilometers, so we will definitely be returning. It's just a matter of when. <sighs> These parts are always uh, so stressful. You spend, you spend so much time on a mission, you, you do all these... Fun things, dangerous things, things that you were so glad you caught on camera, and then it can all be ruined by re-entry. So we go ahead and spin our way to kind of dissipate some of the heat so it doesn't linger on one part too long. Little trick works in most cases. Sometimes uh, it makes you lose control, however. Breaking the sound barrel several times over. And now we have passed our periapsis and we are once again rising in altitude. Uh, our apoapsis is still dropping due to the friction of the aero forces, but uh, we are now no longer going to land. We are once again headed out of the atmosphere and we are going to have to do at least one more pass. Unfortunately. Jebediah has a nice little smile on his face. He seems pretty content in all this. Bob, once again, camera shy. And just again spinning to make sure that we don't heat up and explode. The only thing that we can really allow to explode would be the heat shield because uh, any other part of the craft uh, would either destroy the craft entirely, separate it into unmanageable pieces, or lose all of our science. So as the sun sets on Kerbin, our heat slowly starts to dissipate. We head back towards the Carmen line and then once into the cold emptiness of space. Coming around for a second pass. So 
So we'll skip ahead until we come to the morning time, dawning the sun over the horizon of Kerbin. We open to an eclipse to mark our occasion, to let us know where to come in, where to come home. And there's the dark spot where the eclipse goes, where Kerbals gather, wear their special sunglasses and look up in awe, where some photographers try to catch a glimpse of the returning spacecraft in the silhouette of the sun. So now, once again past the Carmen line, breaking into the atmosphere, we go ahead and point ourselves retrograde and brace for a return. There's nothing the Kerbals can do except for hope and wait. So hope and wait they do. But they tried to obey orders as best they could. Um, while not capable of landing directly at the KSC, it will be a short little Uber trip that they need to take to get back home uh, and get ready for debriefing. <laughs> Let everybody know what space was like, what the moon looks like. What uh, roast beef sandwiches taste like. So our Apoapsis is now coming down very quickly. Uh, because this last pass through the atmosphere is doing quite well to lower atmosphere. That rapid flipping of the camera lets us know that we broke orbit. And now our Apoapsis and Periapsis are well below the atmosphere line. So we are coming home. In the last few moments of our blader uses up all of it and we are still on fire we needed more blader than that and then my parachutes for some reason deploy and that is because i didn't actually set them to i set them to auto deploy but i didn't set uh tell them when so in order to best dissipate the heat because the uh, heat shield was about to explode we decided to go into a controlled tumble to kind of flip around uh as best we can and pretty soon we pass below 20 kilometers and the heat is gone we jettison our heat shield to lower our weight yes and we get ourselves ready i don't have the parachutes pre-clicked which would have helped so i have to kind of fight against the rocking back and forth to click on one of the parachutes to deploy it one of the drogue chutes luckily uh, unfortunately i didn't uh, pre-click the other one either so now i'm going to have to wrangle it and uh, try to get it deployed in time to slow us down. We don't have our real shoot radial shoots. And those are the big ones, yes. And so that's uh, that's unfortunate. So hopefully our drogue shoot and this little top Mach 1 parachute will be enough. But as you see from our surface speed, it was slowly, or rather quickly, descending. So we are slowing down. Get a nice shot of the eclipse as we go down. And I go ahead and I'm going to speed up the footage quite significantly because it took a while to descend, but it was just ever so breathtaking. Our parachutes open to their full extent. We drop down to a cool four point something meters per second. We know that we will arrive home alive and well with a bunch of science all is good so it took a while let's go ahead and skip forward just let you see that we indeed touch down splash down uh, off the coast of the island you can't see it because it's nighttime but we're pretty close to the KSC it was uh it was all in all I would say that that was mission successful I think uh I you know there were places where we probably do better but i think overall that was a good run and i'm looking forward to our next crewed mission maybe we'll uh we'll see what min Mist has to offer but anyways that is where i'm gonna leave today's episode thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed it i hope you're looking forward for more kxp if you did please consider giving me a like drop me a comment let me know your thoughts and i will see you all in the next one take care